Have you ever heard that toilets in the Southern Hemisphere spin a different direction than toilets in the Northern Hemisphere? Well, this is actually a myth and it's not true, but it's based on something that is real, which is the Coriolis effect. And that the Coriolis effect is the reason, for example, hurricanes spin different directions in the Northern and Southern Hemisphere. It just doesn't have an effect on things as small as your toilet, but it can impact various areas of your life. For example, if you've ever been in a plane, your plane actually has to take into account the Coriolis effect because it will change its, it has to change its course because of the rotation of the earth. Now that might've been a little bit wordy. So let's just go into a drawing here to try to understand the Coriolis effect on the left. Pretend that is a merry-go-round that isn't rotating. And on the right, it's a merry-go-round that is rotating. I know my drawings aren't the best, but they'll suffice for this picture. So let's go to this one on the left first, and let's give this guy a ball. And he's going to roll the ball to the other guy. That ball is just going to roll in a straight line. And then that is the actual path that it's taking. Now the perceived path, is going to be the exact same. Now, let's come over to where the merry-go-round is rotating. And we're going to rotate it counterclockwise because it's almost like you're up in space looking down on the northern hemisphere. And let's say he lets go of the ball when he's over here. That ball is going to go into a straight line and it's going to appear to land towards the right of the person that he was trying to throw it to. And let's label this as actual. Now, how they're going to perceive this is going to be different than the actual path the ball is taking. This guy's gonna think he threw it, and they're going to think it curved off to the right. So that is perceived. Let's just say per. So that's their perceived path of the ball. So the point I'm trying to make here is the ball actually is going in a straight line, but it just looks like it's curving because the people and the plane that they're on is rotating and moving. So to relate this to an airplane, an airplane actually is going in a straight line or it would be going in a straight line, but because the earth is rotating beneath it, it actually has to change its course to land in the correct destination. So. To understand that, we can actually just look at our Earth right here. And we'll come in and we'll draw some airplanes in here. So let's draw an airplane right here. Let's draw an airplane right here. And let's draw an airplane right here. Now their destination they're trying to get to is on these various lines. That's zero latitude, 30 latitude, and 60 latitude. And the point that I'm trying to make here is the deviation or the difference because of the Coriolis effect in actual path and perceived path is going to be larger the higher up you go. So for example, on the equator, that airplane just takes a straight path. There is no Coriolis effect. Now here, there's going to be a small deviation. Let's label that right there. And then as you get higher up, that deviation is going to be much larger. So the basic takeaway there is as you get to higher latitudes, the Coriolis effect is stronger. And that has to do with a lot of different aspects of physics that we're not going to exactly dive into. You just have to take my word for it. At the equator, Coriolis effect is zero. As you go higher to the pole, it is stronger. So now let's just break down what's actually going on with these forces. So let's turn this on and look at another layer here. Okay. So let's draw in what's going on with the pressure gradient force first. So pressure gradient force is just going to be going from high to low. So it's going like that, like that, and like that. And this is our pressure gradient force. 
What that means is basically the air likes to flow from high to low. You can see we're going from 908 millibars to 900 millibars. So you would think that our winds are just going to follow the pressure gradient force. It's going to go from high to low. So let's pick a different color here. Let's put our green as our winds. But it's actually not going to be flowing straight from the high to the low. It's going to be slightly curved right there. Slightly, eh, let's go slightly more curved right here. And then eventually completely curved right there. So why does this happen? And I should label this actual wind. This happens because of the Coriolis force. So let's take this bottom one, the one closest to the 900 mil 908 millibars, and let's imagine our wind was going straight high to low. The Coriolis force is going to come in there and it's going to turn it slightly to the right. So it turns it that way. Then, as it keeps going, it turns it a little bit more. Then as it keeps going, it turns it until it's actually just flowing parallel to our isobars. So you might need a second to look at this drawing to actually figure out what's going on here. And then you can start to see how this can form the circulation around a low pressure system. And this is what you would call a geostrophic wind. It's not exactly this perfect in the atmosphere because there's lots of different things going on, but it's a pretty good approximation. So we can pretty much run with it. So to understand what's going on here, let's come in here, let's turn that off, let's make a new group, and let's try to figure out what would be happening around a low pressure system. So the pressure gradient force, we're looking at the left here, that's going to be directly in. And then taking what we learned in our last drawing, our actual wind is going to be parallel to the isobars, the lines of constant pressure, and then our Cor Coriolis force is always to the right of the wind in the northern hemisphere. So what's going to be happening here? Our wind is going to be going counterclockwise, and this is a low pressure system. So right there you can see why in the northern hemisphere you have counterclockwise flow around a low pressure system. It's the combination of the pressure gradient force, I should probably label this, it's a combination of the pressure gradient force and Coriolis. So now let's look at the high pressure. So now our high is in the middle right here, so, and our low is on the outside. It's going from 904 millibars to 900 millibars. Pressure gradient force is going to go from high to low, so it's pointing outward. But then our Coriolis force is going to want to turn those winds to the right. First, it's going to turn it a little bit. Then it's going to turn it a little bit more. And then it's going to turn it all the way until it's parallel with those isobars. Coriolis force is always directly to the right of our actual wind. And you can see that around a high pressure system in the northern hemisphere, you are going to get clockwise flow. So in the low, it's counter. And around the high, it's clock. And that's talking about the northern hemisphere. In the opposite hemisphere, that's like if we took our merry-go-round example and now you're in space looking up at the southern hemisphere, it looks like it's spinning clockwise. So when the one person throws the ball to the other person, it's actually going to look like the ball is curving to the left. Now let's take another example here and talk about wind speed. So taking our forces that we were talking about, let's say flowing from high to low again. Here's our actual, actually, I wanna make that smaller at first. 
and let's actually start this one over because the point I'm making, it's important what size the arrows are. So there's our pressure gradient force. Here's our actual wind. And here's our Coriolis force. Except what we're thinking is this is water in a river. Now everybody knows that in a river, when it's very wide like that, it's going to be very slow moving water. But then as the river tightens up, that water is going to start moving a lot faster. So what's going to happen is that force is going to increase. This force is going to increase. And then your actual water speed is going to increase as well. So just kind of drawing the forces in there to illustrate what we're talking about. But just think water goes faster as you funnel it. So now we can just picture the exact same thing over here. At first, pressure gradient force is somewhat weak. We're going from 944 to 940 over a very long distance. So over each little iteration, it's not all that strong. But as those pressure bars get closer together, that force is going to feel stronger. This is basically what I'm trying to explain here is why winds get stronger as isobars get tighter. It's one of the easiest things that you can see on a weather map. As isobars get closer together, things get windier. Now let's draw in our Coriolis here. It's small here. It's large. And the reason for that actually has to do with the wind speed. So actual, it's small. Here, it is large. The reason your Coriolis force increases is because Coriolis force is proportional to how fast you're going. So a jet is actually going to feel more Coriolis force than a slow moving airplane. So we covered a lot of different ideas here. Hopefully that was helpful. I believe that was the last idea that we needed to cover. Yes, it was. <laughs> so basic summary. Toilets don't spin opposite directions depending on the hemisphere because Coriolis force only acts on much larger objects that are moving much faster, such as hurricanes or airplanes. And in the northern hemisphere, things appear to curve to the right. In the southern hemisphere, they appear to curve to the left. And around a low in the, in the northern hemisphere, things spin counterclockwise. Around a high, things turn clockwise. So hopefully this was helpful, and thanks for watching.